Hello, uh, family. This is Minister Darwin Jackson. Welcome to another edition of uh, Salt and Light Bible Study, uh, Ministry of Vernon Park Church of God, uh, where the Reverend Gerald January is our pastor. And uh, trust and pray that you've been uh, blessed through these lessons on love uh, that we've been doing this quarter. Uh, this week, uh, week's edition is uh, the title is Abiding Love. Okay. And uh, let's get into the word right away today. Uh, let's bow for a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy toward us, Lord God. And we, we stand in awe of you this morning, this morning as we uh, take in your word, Lord God. We pray that you would uh, allow your word to speak to the hearts of your people, Lord God. And we pray that it would bear fruit in their lives, Lord God and that you would be glorified as a result of it, Lord God. Give us ears to hear, Lord God, and to not only be hearers only, Lord God, but doers as well. We give you the glory in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, and as I mentioned, this week's Bible study is called Abiding Love. Uh, we're gonna be reading uh, from the scripture in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses four through 17. Those are gonna be our main verses today. And then there'll be some other supporting verses that we'll use to draw out this whole uh, concept and theme of abiding love, amen? And uh, as we prepare uh, for this scripture, keep in mind, Jesus is preparing his disciples for the, his inevitable departure. So he's trying to make sure that uh, just as if you were, um, about to go on a long trip and you want to make sure things were in order with your family before you left, there's certain things that you would instruct them and, 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 and tell them to do uh, in your absence. And that's just what he was doing with his disciples here. He was preparing them for his, for his uh, inevitable departure. And it reads in uh, John 15, beginning in verse four, it says, abide in me, and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless, it's abide, unless it abides in the vine. And neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. That's a Salem moment right there. Without, for without me, you can do nothing. Uh, vines were very popular in this uh, region of the world at the time. So this analogy, this metaphor that Jesus was using was very uh, appropriate for his listeners. And he, he tells them, I'm the true vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Uh, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned, okay? He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Amen, isn't that powerful? By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the father loved me, I also have loved you abide in my love. So the same love that he received from the Father, he's given to us. The same love that we receive from the Father is the same love that we give out to others. Amen. And to, to abide in the Greek, it means to remain or to not depart. And this is the main point of Jesus's metaphor in this passage. Uh, and it's applicable to us today. Uh, we remain through intimate time with the Lord through daily worship, prayer, and Bible study. Uh, we also remain and abide in God through obedience to his word and uh, obedience to the Holy Spirit. Uh, also, fellowship with and love toward other believers, along with service to our fellow man and one another, are ways that we abide in this relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in this passage, he goes on to say, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, 
that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask in the Father, ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Uh, whenever a teacher emphasizes something, there's importance there. Uh, there's priority there. And, and Jesus has commanded his disciples in these uh, final times together to love one another. It's evident that that was emphasized throughout this scripture. And for us today, if we're going to bear the type of fruit that, that God wants us to bear in our lives, in our ministries, then we're going to have to love one another family. Okay. He says, you are my friends. If you do whatever I command you, God has commanded us, commanded us to love one another. And command is to give an authoritative order and it, it's when something, it, uh, you have the ability to use or control something, okay? Uh, and King David, as I was considering our topic today, was a great example of someone who practiced the presence of God. And as a result of practicing God's presence, King David bore fruit in his life that not only benefited his family, but an entire nation. Uh, God and God's presence took David from being a shepherd boy to killing giants and performing other great feats too, and ultimately becoming king of God's people, Israel. Like many others, uh, there were lapses of judgment in David's leadership and his ability to abide and remain in God's presence. Uh, one such example is found in 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. And uh, I want to pick that story up in 2 Samuel 11, verses 2 uh, through 5. It says, Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. Uh, David was supposed to be at war at this time but uh, he had uh, made the choice to stay home and let his general Joab and the army uh, take care of the war. And as a result, he was out of position. Uh, so David is on his roof late at night and he sees this beautiful woman. Uh, just think of the most beautiful woman that you've ever seen, okay? And David sees this woman and he's captivated. So the scripture says that David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Then she went back home. And the Bible says the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I'm pregnant. Okay. so. Uh, Bathsheba's pregnant. So as a result of this news, uh, verse six says that David sent word to Joab, which was the general of the army, saying, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing and how the people were doing and how the war prospered. So David was making small talk, small talk and it seemed like he was you know, interested in getting a report to see how the war was doing. And Uriah just happened to be the person who would bring him the update and the news. But David actually had other plans. And we'll find more about that in just one moment. So then David attempts twice over the course of two days to get Uriah to go down and be with his wife Bathsheba so David can cover his indiscretion. But Uriah wasn't having it. Uh, listen to what is in this dedicated warrior's heart when questioned by the king as to why he didn't go down to his house 
to be with his wife during this reprieve from the war. And we, we see this in verse 11. It says, and Uriah said to David, the ark in Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents and my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. This man is loyal and committed to the cause. He is dedicated. And as a result of his dedication, David's plan is foiled, okay? And David becomes impatient, okay? David doesn't allow things to take their course. He becomes impatient and takes matters into his own hands. When he is unable to, unable to do what he wants to do after two failed efforts to convince Uriah to go down to his wife and, and, and uh, uh, you know, have intercourse so that uh, it can appear that this baby is in fact uh, Uriah's baby, baby instead of David's baby, okay? So David succumbs to outright murder. Okay, and in verse, verses 14 through 16, it says, in the morning, it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter, set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. So it was while Joab besieged the city that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Remember, God is watching all of this. Beloved, I have a question for you today. Where has God assigned you? Uh, perhaps in your family or on your job, in God's kingdom. Uh, what is your assignment? Where have you been placed? God would have us focus on our assignment, where he has placed us individually, and collectively, we ought not to judge or compare our assignment with someone else's assignment. Or even as a church, uh, we, we ought not to judge or compare our church's assignment with another church's assignment. Let's keep our focus on what God has assigned us to do, lest we be unwise. And the Apostle Paul shines light on this truth in uh, 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. Uh, it reads, uh, we do not dare classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves. They are not wise. And that's the NIV version. Uh, the English standard, standard version says it this way. Uh, not that we dare classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. And then how about the New Living Translation uh, version? It says, oh, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are, but they are only comparing themselves with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. How ignorant. Research reveals that Paul's critics were commending themselves to Corinthians based on secular standards that included dramatic speaking ability and skillful self-promotion. Paul is not participating in the cultural competition to be the most popular, or most followed public personality. Our words to one another and to other uh, ministries ought to be, hold the line. Wherever God has placed you in, 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 in in ministry or in your assignment, hold the line there. We're, we're all on the same team. You hold the line there, I'll hold the line here. If we can assist one another, then let's do that. Okay, so wherever God has hold, uh, placed you this morning, beloved, hold the line. As individuals, as a congregation, hold the line. Let's get back to our story of David. Uh, did certain things jump out at me based on what we've uh, looked at so far. Uh, David was the architect of this murder. 
This was his plan, okay? Uh, secondly, as the general, Joab or King David in this situation, determine where one is positioned and what they will contend with. Uh, and so it is true today, leaders set and assign roles and responsibilities, utilizing their relationship with God, their experience, and the vision that God gives them to guide them when assigning roles. Uh, third thing, every battle, whether natural or spiritual, has a hottest spot. Experienced leaders recognize these areas and proceed accordingly. Another uh, insight is Uriah was not your average warrior. I believe he was able to handle himself under normal circumstances when the unit working was working as it is supposed to work. Uh, I believe it took a lot to kill him. Uh, Uriah is listed as one of David's mighty men. In 2 Samuel 23 and 39, he's listed as number 37. And these guys were no joke. Uh, check out some of the feats they accomplished individually and collectively. And then the fifth uh, point that got my attention was, how do you retreat from your comrade? Someone that who's uh, laid down his life for you, you laid your life down for them. Certainly this had to be a heart-wrenching uh, thing for those privy to this plot. If they truly understood the bond of brotherhood and laying one's life down for his brother, uh, this was an elite team of fighting men. There is only one common enemy. Okay, and so it is in our spiritual battle. There's only one common enemy, and that's the devil. And as believers, we must work together. And the second or the sixth uh, insight that I noticed was this was not the humble shepherd boy, David. Uh, who lived for God's honor and remained in the presence of God. This was a King David that was absent from God's presence and his will. And you know the expression that we uh, learned in high school, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This was David's uh, uh, tale. And number seven, while God was not behind this course of action, he did have a response. And let's jump down to 2 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 11, verses 20, 26 through 27. It says, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house. And she became his wife and bore him a son. Listen to this, beloved. It says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Another word for displeased is disgusted. The thing that David had done disgusted the Lord. David had killed many people in war and battle for the honor of the Lord. But there was something about this murder that left a bad taste in God's mouth. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Um, and then there's at least a year or two between chapters 11 and chapter 12, and the baby has been born that uh, David and Bathsheba uh, had together. And it would appear that David's murder scheme has been successful. But God in his providence sends a prophet, a man of God named Nathan, Nathan to David. And prophets can be strange and may have a different way of communicating things many times. Um, by this time, David has settled in with Bathsheba by his side, and their child has been born. <coughs> born, excuse me. Nathan the prophet tells David, David a story about two men in one city, one rich and one poor. And it tells about how uh, the rich man has a guest who's coming. And instead of taking from his flock to uh, feed his guests, he takes this poor man's one and only sheep to, uh, to prepare for, for his visitor. And, and Nathan is telling this story. Uh, and as David's listening, 
uh, that 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 warrior in him, that that uh, that God thing in him is aroused to 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 righteousness in this situation. And David can plainly see uh, the error of this of this rich man's ways. So uh, as a result, uh, David says this man should be killed. And uh, the prophet Nathan tells him, David, you are this man, okay? And he begins to tell David's story and, and tell him how, how all the things that God had done for him and how he had taken him from the sheep pen and, and made him king over his people. And he really, Nathan really shares God's heart uh, in this. I, I hope you have time to really read it and get into detail. Uh, but God says, and if that had not been enough, you know, I would have given you this and that, you know, and it doesn't give specifics. It's almost like intimate, like only things that they shared that he was, you know, referencing. Uh, so that speaks to the intimacy that David and uh, God shared. And then when we jump down to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 9 and 10, um, it, uh, the Nathan the prophet says, why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Because God saw all of this. And despise means to regard with contempt, distaste, disgust, or disdain to scorn or to loathe. Now, if anything, you think, why did you do this to uh, Uriah? But that's not what it says. It says, why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Okay, so God wasn't, uh, taking the okie doke, he saw exactly, no, this wasn't, you used them to get what you wanted. And, 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 and that's, the, uh, that's the crux of the matter. It's, and then God passes judgment on David. He says, now therefore the short sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. Wow. The Bible tells us that David is a man after God's own heart. Uh, but even in that accurate description, this is a time where David failed to abide, failed to remain in that close presence with God and there were consequences. Um, I was thinking about something that uh, our pastor, Pastor January used to mention all the time, of, you know, a while back. He said, God keeps good records. And I believe this is true. Uh, David found this out in this situation. And later he found it out again, further along in his reign. Um, if you look at 2 Samuel chapter 21, uh, verses 14, it gives this other description of how accurate God's records can be. Uh, it reads, uh, now there was a famine in the days of David for three years, year after year. And David finally, as a leader, he inquired of the Lord and the Lord answered, it is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. So this is God's response to why this drought, this uh, famine is going on in the land. So the king called the Gibeonites. So after got, uh, David got this answer to his prayer from God about why they were experiencing this drought, he called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. He, and, and now the Gibeonites not, were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. The children of Israel had sworn protection to them. But look at this. But Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. And we know the Bible says that uh, zeal is not good without knowledge, okay? So once again, Saul is impatient here in his effort to uh, uh, his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah, you know, 
uh, Saul is proud of his nation. He's the king. He's the leader. So he's trying to promote them. But in doing that, he makes some costly mistakes here that ultimately affect his people. Uh, so therefore, David said to the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement that you may bless the inheritance of the Lord? Uh, and the Gibeonites said to him, we will have no silver or gold from Saul or from his house, nor shall you kill any man in Israel for us. So he said, and this is David talking here. So he said, whatever you say, I will do for you. Okay. And sometimes we think, you know, we, we know and understand God's word, but many times we can fall short, short. We have to really dig in and, and ask God to give us continual revelation and insight, uh, especially in, in positions of leadership as we're over other people and uh, doing what God has called us to do. Um, and I considered another example of just how, how this takes place. If you look at Acts chapter 10, verses uh, 13 through 16, we have an incident here where uh, Peter is on the roof praying and, uh, and he's hungry at this time. And, uh, and he sees this vision and, and these animals are on this sheet as it's uh, going down. And these are all animals that uh, as an Israelite, you know, they're not supposed to eat. And he hears this voice and talks to him and says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter responds, surely not, Lord. Peter replied, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. So Peter's trying to uh, give his resume to the Lord about how good he's been in, in regard to not eating these things that they're not supposed to eat. Okay. And this happened three times. And that's, that's emphasis there. This happened three times. And, uh, and uh, immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. And, and God, by his spirit, must give us all a deeper understanding of his word and his ways. Uh, and, in, in, and especially at, when it comes to leading people. Uh, so as our lesson talks about in regard to abiding uh, in God's presence, uh, we have to stay there uh, in order to uh, make sure that we're, we're, we're going on the right presence. And like David, many of us do have times when we, we fall short, uh, we get distracted, but that's when we have to get back up and get back into his presence so that we can be, get back on the path that God has called us to. And it's the light uh, that proceeds from our Lord and Savior working through us that uh, does that work. Amen. And it was uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said, darkness can not drive out darkness. Only light can, spell, can dispel darkness. And so it is that God's light must abide in us through our fellowship and in intimacy with God that, so that we can truly be the lights of the world that he has called us to be. I'm out of time, beloved. I pray that God has ministered to you through his word today as we've shared. Um, if, you, if it's your time to give, pray that you would use the, uh, the avenues to give, whether it be tithely, whether dropping it off uh, at the church P.O. box. Um, uh, there should be some information on the screen now that will allow you to do that. Uh, let's, let's bow and have a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your word, Lord God. We thank you for the many examples in your word that you've given to us to uh, help us, Lord God, uh, follow after you in a way that honors you and blesses you, Lord God. I pray that you would bless your people to remain and abide in your presence and not depart from you, Lord God. Help us to fulfill the call that you place on our life individually as well as collectively. Uh, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Uh, go in peace.